Excellent. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So I, I wasn't very sure what I wanted to talk about, which is why I gave Vladimir a pretty vague title. Um, and uh, I think what I, what I am going to talk about is quite different in some ways to a lot of the presentations, certainly that we had in the first two days. I think there's more similarity with presentations that we've had today, which is a relief. Um, but I thought, you know, rather than um, focusing too much, for instance, on Sri Aurobindo's philosophy of education or something like this, I would uh, talk instead a little bit more about my own work um, at present. Uh, I was awake in the early hours of this morning feeling profoundly insecure about what I was going to talk about. Um, and I was sitting in concentration. Um, and two, two things came to me from the mother. So I decided that I would start off by reading these two things. Uh, I think one of them, I think, well, let, let me read them. Let them speak for themselves. So the first comes from, um, from the prayers and meditations. Right. You just get the eyes. <laughs> what are these powerful gods whose hour of manifestation upon earth has come, if not the varied and perfected modes of thy infinite activity. O thou master of all things, being and non-being, and what is beyond, marvelous, unknowable one, our sovereign Lord. What are these manifold, brilliant intellectual activities, these countless sunbeams illumining, conceiving, and fashioning all forms, if not one of the modes of being of thy infinite will, one of the means of thy manifestation? O thou master of our destinies, sole unthinkable reality, Sovereign Lord of all that is and all that is not yet. And all these mental powers, all these vital energies, and all these material elements, what are they if not thyself in thy outermost form, thy ultimate modes of expression, of realization? O oh, thou whom we adore devotedly and who escapest us on every side, even while penetrating, animating, and guiding us. Thou whom we cannot understand or define or name. Thou whom we cannot seize or embrace or conceive and who are yet realized in our smallest acts. And all this enormous universe is only an atom of thy eternal will. And all this enormous universe is only an atom of thy eternal will. In the immensity of thy effective presence, all things blossom. That's the first thing that came to me. The second one, the mother says in response to a question, <clears throat> never say so-and-so so and so does not do this, so-and-so does something else. That one does what he should not do. All this is not your concern. You have been put upon earth in a physical body with a definite aim, which is to make this body as conscious as possible, make it the most perfect and most conscious instrument of the divine. 
He has given you a certain amount of substance and of matter in all the domains, mental, vital, and physical, in proportion to what he expects from you. And all the circumstances around you are also in proportion to what he expects of you. And those who tell you, my life is terrible, I lead the most miserable life in the world, are donkeys. Everyone has a life appropriate to his total development. Everyone has experiences which help him in his total development. And everyone has difficulties which help him in his total realization. So I, I thought I would, uh, I would start by sharing these two pieces, partially because I think they say something about mother's uh, sense of humor and how she put my uh, <laughs> insecurity and anxiety to rest. Um, so uh, I would like to start by, I'd like to, to take, take this in two parts, I guess. The first thing that I'd like to talk to you about, about is um, about the way that I'm increasingly coming to understand organizations and principles of organization and how organizations work. And all of this might seem a little um, irrelevant and technical. Um, I, I hope that's not the case. And all of us have varying experiences of being in organizations. Um, and I hope that it will make sense to you from that perspective. Um, but I want to share this with you because I think that this is, has a, a very real relevance to what I want to talk to in the second part, which is really um, uncomfortable for me to share. Uh, and um, at the same time, I'm excited to have a conversation about it, which is really to talk about my practice doing this work and how I'm attempting to um, bring um, bring my sadhana into this work with organizations. Uh, and I feel that's a lot of where the insecurity sits for me and that I know that I'm a lot, f not nearly as far down the road in this journey as many other people in this room are. Um, and yet I feel like this is an opportunity where we can have a more engaged conversation about what does this really look like. <laughs> um, you know, there's a lot of talk about philosophy, about the, the Vedic epistemology, um, <clears throat> and all of these, these beautiful ideas. Um, and I, I've spent a lot of my career working in pretty rarefied atmospheres as, a, as an academic, as a, a, a teacher working in alternative education um, where it's, it's easy to hold on to some of that idealism because you're insulated to some degree from the reality <laughs> of the world, which I've dipped in, in and out, out of you know, in various projects along the way. Um, the work I find myself doing now is very different. I find myself working in organizations, in businesses, uh, and sometimes I feel like, sometimes I, sometimes I can have moments of, uh, of self-doubt where I feel separated from my aspiration and I can feel really caught up in the mundaneness of this work and uh, feel like a, some sort of corporate sellout. <laughs> and at the same time, I know that this work needs to happen. Um, and it's difficult for me. And I believe that that if anybody can identify with the challenge I'm talking about right now, I would appreciate it if you would put up your hand or something. So I don't feel quite so alone. Okay, <laughs> great. <laughs> right. 
yeah, I don't know if that's the solution for me, though. Um, so, that's, that's where I'm going, messily and uh, as efficiently as I'm able to. Uh, well, I'm going backwards, that's not good. So, I think that this is the way that a lot of people understand organizations and understand the role of consultants in organizations. And organizations are seen as closed systems, as complex adaptive systems, as the, um, you know, the way that they, they normally refer to, that contain individuals. Um, and that consultants act upon those systems from outside um, and can somehow make them change. So this could be with a business consultant, but it could be when we go into any kind of system in the sense, organization, if we go to work with a school, there's an idea that an individual can come as an autonomous expert from the outside, do something to the system, um, to this thing which we give a life of its own, this entity which we create, prod it and poke it, find the right kind of acupressure point to make something systemic happen, and in that way we can um, influence its future. Um, and if you look at a lot of consulting work, this is what it kind of comes down to. Um, we, we believe that experts stand on the outside of that entity and act upon it in some way, uh, and that this directs it into the future. Um, helps to give it strategic vision or whatever language you want to use. Um, I think that this is, I increasingly believe that this way of thinking about organizations is inherently problematic for a number of reasons. Um, so I, I think the first problem here is that this view of learning and of organization is very idealistic and simplistic, has a very simplistic hu view of human nature that doesn't take account of threats to identity, power relations, conflicting ideologies, conflictual politics, anxiety, all of the messiness and complexity of what takes place in the space between individual human beings um, is negated by containing them and subordinating them to this idea of an organization. Um, I think there's some philosophical, logical inconsistencies, which I won't get into too much now, um, infinite regress being the, the most significant one. Um, but I think what's more important is that this doesn't really fit with our experience of reality either. Because if we really are honest with ourselves, we realize that human beings are way more complex than this. Human beings make all sorts of choices for all types of reasons. Um, you know, we, we, we led to believe, you know, that there's a nation state, a political system that leads people to behave in particular ways. That's not true. That's not true at all. You know, people behave in an enormous variety of ways. And of course, their um, their larger constraints in their environment that might, um, you know, have a kind of soft effect on directing people's behavior. Um, but people have agency. <laughs> people have choice. People have freedom. People have will. People have consciousness. Um, and I think it's, there's something degrading and dehumanizing about ig ignoring that. So on a basic level, it seems somehow immoral to make the reality of human experience subservient to an abstraction, this idea of an organization. Um, this is intuitively apparent, which is why I believe organizational models appear to invariably become sites of resistance. Attachments to models, because everybody wants one, um, is, in my experience, motivated partly by expedience 
and partly by a terror of venturing into the unknown without a map, even if the map is an imaginary one which depicts the world as a disk inhabited by Krakens. In both of these cases, the move seems to be one of epistemological laziness. Reliance on the map discourages reflexivity and criticality and obstructs the search for new knowledge. I think that um, what we find is that this way of thinking about organization draws us away from reality, draws us away from the reality of individuals being together moment by moment. Because I think this is more what an organization looks like. I think what an organization really is, is a group of people, <laughs> a group of human beings, and the complex responsive processes that take place between them. What arises moment by moment in our connection to each other um, in a very vibrant and dynamic sort of way. Um, and I think the constraints that we place on ourselves in organizations sometimes serve a functional purpose, uh, but a lot of the time add an additional level of complexity uh, which limits our ability to be in real conversation and in real connection to each other. Um, Right, so that, I'm keeping this as, as the consultant. So this is a really important point. You know, for, for me, one of the biggest fallacies there, which, which is illogical, is the idea that a consultant, an expert, can engage objectively with an organization. The act of consulting makes that impossible. When we engage with other people, we're part of a conversation. Um, and so we're just as immersed in that as anybody else is. Same thing if you're, you know, we have this in other expert types of professions. So teaching is very similar. You know, we have the idea that the teacher somehow stands above the learners and has this kind of objective perspective of them. But of course, they're enmeshed in a conversation. There's a little bit of power asymmetry, like there often is in consulting relationships. Um, and that's another thing which adds unnecessary complexity, which we could try and reduce as much as possible. Um, but I think it's, it's illogical for us to think that they could actually be independent. Um, so a couple of conclusions we can take out of that. Um, whenever we're dealing with humans, complexity arises in the, the many local interactions that take place between them in their ordinary everyday activities of organizational lives. This is what the organization is. Um, it's the complexity which arises in these local interactions. Um, there is no outside position from which an individual or leader can take account of the whole and impose interventions on it. We're always limited by our point of view as somebody enmeshed in these interactions. <clears throat> um, every attempt to control the complex responses of people in participation, so every attempt to constrain people's <clears throat> natural interactions and natural conversation only escalates complexity through other measures. Adaptive pushback, gaming the system, deviant behavior, leveraging power, ranking and politic strategies, obfuscations of all sorts. Um, and this is, you know, this is very much what I've seen when I've gone into organizations. Um, you know, I think when I started doing the work that I, I, I'm doing, I, I entered with this idea that I'm going to help organizations build collaborative capacity. The way I'm going to do that is I'm going to work out the best model under the sun. I'm going to crack the collaboration problem. I'm going to go into the organization. I'm going to teach them this model. We're going to input this model in. It's going to be awesome. Everybody's going to leave us an expert collaborator. They're going to go, as a result of that, they will 
navigate the volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity of the competitive market space with more agility, and everybody will be happy. Um, that's not how it worked out. Um, the reality is what happened is I went in, I met with the CEO, you know, we colluded to find a way to oppress the rest of the organization and try and get them to comply with the CEO's wishes, um, which they all did by attending a workshop and behaving well. And then, viva la resistance, resistance went underground. Um, and this is, very, this is why, you know, culture change interventions in organizations tend not to work. However, you know, not, not dissimilar to what I, I saw, you know, during many hundreds of hours of, of observing in, in kindergarten classrooms. Um, you know, this power dynamic, children are very compliant on the surface, resistance goes underground because their natural conversational interactions are, um, are constrained. It's not a bad thing. It may have instrumentality, but whenever we do that, we pay a price. Um, there's no way to align culture, since culture is constituted by streams of values <coughs> that are continuously shifting in every individual while simultaneously being negotiated among them. There's no monolithic organizational culture. Um, culture is something which is constantly in a state of, of emergence in an organization. Um, again, that doesn't mean that there may not be environmental influences that shape people's behavior, but I think, um, where is he? He's not here. Was it uh, Manoj yesterday? You know, I think he spoke about this very beautifully, this shift in awareness. He said, we started off um, trying to shape Oroville in a particular way, and then we realized that Oroville was shaping us. This is exactly this shift. Um, the culture of the organization is a process, a complex responsive process of becoming. Um, and so the move here is a move from thinking about the intervention as measurable, controllable, and predictable outcome, um, which is you know, the, the way that I think many consultants, and of course I'm being quite reductionistic here, are trained to think about what they do in organizations. You go in, <clears throat> you know, the, the organization has a very particular and clear aim in mind. You create a program which delivers that. You do that. You get the outcome. You measure it. You get paid. And you go smoke a cigar. Um, it moves from that to an appreciation of paradox uh, and uncertainty and a focus on rather than trying to mold some impossible uncertain future, focusing on the quality of conversation, the quality of participation, quality of presence, of creativity, and the sense of dynamic emergent purpose. And that means the cultivation uh, let's leave that one, shall we? Um, that means the cultivation of new skills. Uh, and I've mentioned a couple of them here because I think they, they're relevant to what I will talk about next. Um, the first one I've put there is reflexive inquiry. And for me, this is very close to what Matthijs speaks about a lot, this um, first-person inquiry. Um, what does he talk about? rigorous subjectivity uh, as, as method, um, building this capacity of awareness moment by moment, reflexive awareness and reflective disposition, I think becomes a core skill that we want to cultivate. Um, improvisation, responding dynamically to what arises in the moment. Uh, political adroitness, you know, rather than trying to suppress the natural political nature of conversation, how can we leverage that in generative and constructive ways? Uh, and building a quality of presence. So, that was many, many words from Matthew. 
I'd like us to pause here and uh, I will take any questions or comments or even somebody saying, wow, Matthew, that made some sense to me would probably be appreciated um, before I go on. I see a hand over there. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you can collect your check afterwards. Thanks. <laughs> Right. And uh, I'm coming from, I have been a consultant in one of my lives, uh, career lives. But uh, isn't this concept applicable to families? It's Correct. applicable to a community? Correct. It's applicable to 20 people staying in a building right. together? So, yes, I, I, I'm using the term organization here in a general sense when individuals come together in an organized way. Um, and, you know, we the constraints that we place on those organizations differ from one context to a next, the next. So, you know, in things like public institutions or the military or something, they're particularly constricting, you know, whereas in, you know, a family or a community, there might be less so. The it, principles apply across the board. From my experience, I think it's just the layers and layers. So for probably with organizations, because I don't have to really believe you and only pretend that I believe you which makes it easier to just be pretensive. But in, say, a family context where you actually have to spend a lot more time, the work gets more necessary. Because you always know, okay, this, this job doesn't work for me. I Cut think, I think in, a, in a smaller organizational unit, like a family, um, where there's a naturally higher level of vulnerability and trust, the dynamics shift more in this direction. However, you know... <laughs> I can tell you I spent a lot of my childhood not telling my father what I really thought. <laughs> yeah, because the, the complexities and, like you said, vulnerability. Hmm. So vulnerability is the biggest challenge that I think at a personal level most of us face. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments, thoughts? Yes, sorry. I'm grateful that you're touching in, I think, one of the crucial themes of, of Auroville between the individual, personal, sadhana and the power of that or the shortcomings of it and the collective process. It's, I think it's a question since the beginning of Auroville. How much uh, are they relating to and can they inform and some support or obstruct each other in mm. those ways? I still have a question when you say an organization is not a system because uh, even, let's say, uh, we have this beautiful monk awarded Japanese gardener here and he told me he was recently invited to a world conference on complex adaptive systems of communication right. and all of that and he gave this beautiful image of a garden as a system right. but as a system which how to say, it's not predictable because you don't know the wind can shift, yep. you don't know when the birds are coming in and which animal is where at which, which point. So I wouldn't, that's my question, Could, can you say organization, maybe there's a so, higher form of a system which incorporates, like even our organism, it incorporates that unpredictability of life, yeah. of the life force and maybe also what calls or informs that system from above, I still would call it a system. And, and you, you, you may do that with pleasure. But, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, this is a prevalent way of, of thinking about organizations, um, which is very influenced by, uh, by the natural sciences. Um, and uh, you're correct in saying that I, 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 re I would resist that. Um, for me, there are certain logical inconsistencies with that thinking where we use um, <clears throat> natural science metaphors like an organism. Um, you know, so, for instance, um, people often say, well, we've moved away from understanding organizations as machines, as complicated, mechanistic, linear kinds of things into a more complex, adaptive understanding. So we understand them more 
like organisms or like gardens and all of these pieces fit together in a whole. Um, I don't see it. Uh, I, I spent a lot of my life seeing it that way. My experience is leading me to see it that way less and less, although I still think that's a very nice idea. Um, my experience is showing me more and more like a, that metaphor doesn't really hold true uh, and in a way can be quite dehumanizing because I know what does exist <laughs> are the individual people and the spaces between them. And sometimes I'll focus on this thing which may or may not be an organism you know, which is an imaginary, um, is at the detriment of the individuals who make up that organization. That needn't necessarily be the case, but that's often what happens as a result of that sort of metaphorical thinking. So my, my move is to move away from those natural science metaphors towards more heuristic ways of thinking, which are more focused on the individual and the complex response of spaces between individuals rather than this sort of containing membrane, rather looking at the, the, the little bits of electricity. <laughs> you know, um, Martin Buber, the Jewish philosopher, had a beautiful quote. He said, um, when two people relate to each other authentically and humanly, God is the electricity that flows between them. And I'm more interested in that electricity right now. And, you know, I might grow up and it might change. Sorry. Uh, okay. I, you partly already answered some of my questions because I also was wondering that what do you mean by systems? And to me, because I come from an open systems background and I, I, I see what you're, and, and that's important what you said. And I see that, uh, but, but uh, how important it is. I also see that there are levels that uh, the, syst the open systems is kind of a structure that you have or some of the influences that, that even if you have that diet or uh, triad or whatever you have, you still have some organizational uh, influences. So um, what I was wondering, would you agree with the idea that organization is a kind of a body of people? And what would it mean if it's a body of people? And then another question I had is that, do you make a difference between organization and an institution? And do you uh, make difference between task-based uh, organizations or inst inst uh, institutions and emotion-based uh, organizations and institutions? I'm asking this for, for a reason. And the third thing is that what we, with Lakshmi and uh, was it Marta or who, we discussed about the agency. Do you remember? one or two days back. And uh, agency seems to be a very European concept. Mm. So how does it apply to surroundings where agency is not the primary way of functioning? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, all, all excellent questions. Um, so, you know, in terms of, of thinking of the organization as a body, I guess that is kind of what I, I was saying to Aurelio. Um, for me, I, I agree that there are, there will always be structures which govern our interactions. These are constraints. Um, my contention is that these are constraints which we create um, and often we create too many of them um, in a way which limits our natural ability to be in connection with each other. Uh, and I think that those kinds of metaphors lead us towards doing that. Um, so, you know, I think we're sitting here, we have a format, I sit in front, I talk to you, you all listen. There's a cost to all of these constraints, but to some degree they may be practically necessary some of the time, and we choose to introduce them or not. Um, and I think this awareness allows us to be more judicious in how we do that to a degree. Um, in terms of agency, this is a really, really interesting question. And actually, I think that this has come up uh, in the last two days in the way that we've um, been talking about consciousness as power. <laughs> um, and... Uh, I think that's really what this is about to some degree. Um, and 
I, I do think that that shows up in a particular way in European thinking about psychology and about organization um, because it tends to valorize the individual. Um, so I think in more uh, communitarian ways of thinking about interaction, that shows up differently. Um, but I think that it is on a basic level dehumanizing to rob people of choice um, and the freedom that they take in interactions. And I think that it exists whether it's implicit or acknowledged. Um, so, you know, in, in South Africa, where, where I come from, we have this very prevalent way of thinking, um, philosophy, which touches on our lives broadly um, called Ubuntu. Um, and they say, Umtunguntu Ngabantu, which means uh, a person becomes a person through people. Um, and you know, so this is a very different way of thinking about agency. And yet, there is a locus of choice that exists in the midst of it. Yeah, I mean, I like power of consciousness, but I don't know how that would land with my clients. Um, maybe. I, I think, I think uh, if I say locus to some of the CEOs that I work with, I think I'm talking about a grasshopper. So... <laughs> But yes, I see the semantic difficulty there. Yes. Um, you called your presentation something about complexity. I work for an organization that also talk about complexity, but in their um, ritual annual restructuring, they always throw such a big spanner around that it, I would call it chaos. So the last time we lost 26% of our students in the bachelor degree, we lost a million dollars. We saved $100,000 because people were retrenched. We lost a million. Now, I don't know what sort of business model that is. It certainly doesn't sound sustainable to me. Hmm. So what's your experience? Because as a consultant, well, we have our in-house consultant, course in America who does this sort of stuff for us but uh, you know how do how do you feel as a consultant when you have to sort of work out these sort of structures is that a fair, <laughs> is that a fair question um, exhausted <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess, you know, my, my perspective, and once again, you know, this is partially why I read this quote from the mother in the beginning, and, and that, uh, you know, I realized, like, this is, this is about me. <laughs> so, you know, it's not something which I expect everyone to agree with necessarily. What I'm really interested in that situation is getting to the re getting people to be honest with each other about the reality of what's happening right now in the group. Um, so, you know, I would want to probably be starting with a group, probably quite a senior group, maybe a representative stakeholder group, and be wanting to have a process that actually got those people to get away from talking about the structure and get away from talking about ideology and all of these abstractions and start from a point of reality, which is it's us in this room, we've got to contend with each other and we don't know what's happening. <laughs> and we don't know what the future is, because we don't. It's uncertain. Um, so how do we move forward into that uncertainty together with some, some sort of intention? Um, I, think, um, I think there's a parallel uh, between this paradigm shift and the one that uh, Bindu was indicating in, in, in the classroom. Mm. You know, education reform is um, a big category that Absolutely. Um, includes um, significant strategies uh, that are inquiry-based, for example. And we've been discussing how the integral paradigm might be uh, applied um, in a way that is 
um, more integral. <laughs> and, and, and I think this relates also to the discussion about Hegelianism versus Marxism, sure. where Hegel's idea is more uh, the power of consciousness and, right. and uh, Marx's idea is more the con consciousness of power. And it becomes also fire. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, with regard to the classroom and application, um, the in inquiry-based method um, means that um, students are invited to ask questions and discover answers rather than having those already prefabricated. Right. Um, and, and, and perhaps this um, ru general rubric um, is closely related also to Sri Aurobindo's idea of universalization. You know, if, if we universalize th that consciousness which we are prescribing, <laughs> we know, and it's not really an either or, right. we, we know what that is, but at the same time we have to cultivate it and discover it, um, rather than just holding on to knowing what it is, right. um, shifting into having it become a general power of consciousness um, is uh, really an inversion of the traditional model of teaching. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I think, um, yeah, I, I mean, I agree 100% with that. It can be, you know, habituated to rise to the surface. But uh, I, I think, you know, critical theory, you know, for instance, offers us another lens to have that same conversation. You know, Paulo Freire's idea of di dialogical action, you know, has its limitations, but again, is speaking about the same thing. I think we see many different expressions of this idea. Um, you did talk about systems, and then Aurelio said uh, body. And then I was thinking about the other presentation where they talked about the, like the, the metal particle identifying with the block and um, the person identifying with the group. Uh, be it the house or be it a company or be it a whatever you're in then at that point. And in my experience with my business, if your stakeholders identify with the organization, then whatever you call it, it's still a body. But then I think that is the, if they don't identify anymore, they go or they are let go or something like that, or the cell dies or it's replaced by something else or the... the so which one is that in your... Because it is a system, in my opinion. That's the question. I, I hear it's a system in your opinion. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, what I would say, no, it's not a body. This is a body. What that is is a group of people who identify with an idea. You're saying it's like a body. That's a metaphor that you're using to explain what it's like. But it's not a body. This is a body. Um... And there may be some similarities between the way that that organization behaves and the way a body behaves, but that doesn't make it into a body. Um, it didn't feel that way. It's like uh, the concept of my company was alive. You know, it was attracting people, pushing people away. It's the space between the particles that holds everything together and that makes the people come closer or go away, clients. Yeah, so, so I, th this, is, this is where we disagree, I suppose, because I think there may be a, a central idea which is attractive to people, and I think purpose is really important. Uh, I think uh, a sense of common purpose and how we evolve that together and move into the future with intention is important, but I don't think that your business made people do anything. I think people have their own choice and people chose to come to your business or they chose not to. Um, so that is an essential, an essential difference in our thinking then. We have, there are four, two more questions. I get a little sense of uh, this presentation that it's like a collection of individualities more than, you know, some kind of system or... And I'm wondering whether you have this uh, term up here, presence. Mm. And I'm wondering whether there is a center in those individuals that 
somehow also may bind them in the collective unit of which they are. And whether kind of that center is important to you or in your idea of this and uh, if that's related to this idea of presence. Right. Um, I, yeah, I would, say, I would say absolutely. I would say, uh, you know, a, a sense of... I'm just wanting to choose my words just carefully here. Um, I think what makes an organization sustainable moving forward um, is a sense of shared purpose in some way or another. I think the deeper that sense of shared purpose is, the more meaningful the expression of organization is. Um, you know, I think that if we're united around a common vision around actualizing um, a divine aspiration, this is one thing. Um, but I think on, on a lower level, people need to be excited and drawn by a common intention. Um, and ultimately, that needs to be, you know, in order for, for work to be meaningful, that should be more than getting paid. Um, so I think that's definitely true. Um, I think that the things which connect people in an organization are real and valuable. Um, and I don't think that those people are isolated. I think it's, it's those very points of connection and shared intentionality that make an organization an organization rather than just a stack of, of autonomous individuals. Um, but I think that's a slightly different thing to an organizational metaphor. Uh, that's actually exactly what I was going to uh, comment on. Uh, so uh, I was previously working in an organization where this wasn't happening. So the flux rate of people coming and, and people leaving was very high. Uh, as in, uh, in my approximately one and a half years of working in that company, uh, my entire team had changed around three times. Hmm. And I was probably by the end of the first month and a half, I had already become a trainer for the rest of the employees. Uh, yeah. But uh, I left that organization and now we are running our own school. And uh, there uh, the teachers are expected to take a training from the Pondicherry Ashram or Auroville, depending on the subjects. And uh, the new teachers who don't have an idea of what this training entails, uh, they are still excited about it because people talk about it. So that's the excitation, the learning uh, and the idea of the travel going somewhere. And uh, by the time they come back, it's a different thing because then it's about the purpose of the organization. Hmm. Uh, may I also make an observation which is very interesting because when um, our civilians first our civilians approached the mother and asked her what shall we do what kind of you know laws or structures or guidelines we should create for newcomers uh, how could we know you know we have to really screen them we have to create um, kind of you know guidelines that under which they will enter she said, as long as there are no guidelines, there is still a hope. <laughs> I think we are all heading in that direction. Hmm. We, are, we want to generate that consciousness from within. If it is not coming through our liberty, through our freedom of choice, then there will be always a reaction, always underground uh, repression, suppression, uh, opposition, resistance there will be always something to work out and to fight with. Mm. And this dynamics of uh, individual and collective, which you are reflecting very nicely, uh, was never solved, by the way. Right. There, is, there is either co communal consciousness dominates as it, is, as it was in the Soviet Union, or individual freedom, which is you know, liberalism in the West. 
But now they are building up something new, and uh, in uh, Norway you can find interesting beginnings of neoliberalism. Yeah. And this is something to be looked into. I think you are reflecting something of that development. How two things can coexist, individual freedom and responsibility for the whole structure, which emerges, always emerges and always changes. Mm. It's not the structure which is fixing us and making us dependent. Yeah? Mm. It's a tool, a help, a step forward, and nothing else. Once it is used, it changes. Mm. Something of that kind. Mm. Again, it's a mental thinking. Right. <laughs> I want to know more about uh, the political adroitness. It sounds very good, but uh, uh, in the 50 years I've seen all these political systems come and go. Uh, I think there's some magic in there and I want to understand it. Mm. I think what I'm referring to here... This is pretty much what you also were referring to. I, How I, do we make it work? I think what I'm referring to here is more... Poly I mean, not that I don't think this applies more broadly, but is politics on more of a micro scale. Where, what tends to happen is when we get people together in a group, we <clears throat> put in place organizational constraints that restrain natural political activity. Political activity between human beings is very, very natural. Um, it's, you know, power is a, a natural part of how humans relate to each other. Um, and I think we, what tends to happen is that political activity gets pushed underground. It becomes gossip and, you know, all kinds of pernicious influences, um, because we're told that it's not nice or it's not allowed or it's not being a good team player or whatever the case may be. And I'm sure most of you who've worked in organizations can relate at least a little bit to what I'm saying. I think the skill here is around how we, we, we develop greater adroitness, greater skillfulness in terms of how we leverage that political reality in a generative way and how we can teach more and more people to do that within the organization um, so that it becomes an opportunity for creativity, for generativity, for diversity, for divergence, um, you know, and becomes a strength in how we make decisions together. Um, and, you know, when, when we remove some of those organizational constraints, it lowers the complexity and the stakes and gives us a lot more flexibility in terms of how we do that. I know, I know we're almost at... Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Very we're, much. we're pretty much out of time, um, right? Yes. So, I think uh, it's I, time for us to. I I would really like to ask. I'm putting you on this on the spot, Tong, but I know you're a very quick thinker. I'm just wondering if you have any reflections on, on all of this because I know you do a lot of work in a lot of different types of organisations and how 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 does this land with you? <laughs> I I first appreciate how much sincerity and genuineness you put about your work, your doubts into this you know, public place. Um, I also saw you bring the sadhana into the work and really engaging yourself in that inquiry. And I can tell that your work, the development of your client's work is also dependent on your personal growth. So that connection I can tell. And regarding organization, I, when I work with organization, I work always on three levels of purpose, which is very rightly said by you, that collective. Mm. I would say that really in that, that inner purpose of individual, knowingly and knowingly, we have that. And if our work with organization can ignite that, awaken that, in whatever sense, you know, they not, no, so, so that is regardless the spiritual path you are facing. So everyone has work to do here based on their, you know, the soul's choice. And then the organizational purpose, the shared purpose, so the shared purpose of, of individuals coming together for some common purpose that relate to their individual purpose. Mm. There then the work, the individual work and collective work goes together. Mm. 
And the third level purpose is about the, all these organization purpose and, organization, uh, and individual purpose. When they work together, what is the relevance of the purpose of the evolutionary movement of the society? That you know, I'm talking to you, but I'm, I better talk to here like uh, to that. That, that the, 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 the evolutionary purpose, the, the context of society where we are nationally, internationally, when we are sensing into that deeper purpose and our work are carried by that evolutionary movement. So being consultant, a new, I would say the new pioneering consultants that the world is needing that right, can help organization individuals to, to experiment, to grow, to walk that path, and then co-creating learning with a client, learning with organization. And that journey becomes sadhana because we are doing sadhana in the in the process of work, right. and yet we are awakening, we are enabling, we are facilitating the growth of whatever needs to grow in that process. Um, yeah, I know. I think your story can be longer because of time. You haven't right. shared the rest, but right. from here, I I already tell that the the beautiful journey you are going through. So what I what I imagined doing in a world where time was a little bit more plastic, is uh, looking at these elements of the sadhana, at aspiration, surrender, rejection, and doing some sort of reflection on how I see that showing up and where the struggles are for me in terms of doing this work with those things. So that's still a conversation I'd like to have with people who are interested, but I don't think that this is a good time. Yeah, but this is continue, continue, continuous journey, you know, is with Auroville and then being part of this community, being part of friends of IPK and University of Human Unity, Vladimir, Rod, and Natalia. So it's co-creating, wonderful. Thank you, Tom. Do we get a drink tea now? Yes, yeah, so we can do two things. We can get a break for tea if you are not. The tea is too early after lunch, yes. So we can have our next presentation and then have tea. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you very much.